in modern parlance, people can say they're depressed when they're unhappy or disappointed or feel thwarted or defeated. It's, it's almost become a synonym for sadness or disappointment. But in clinical practice, the, the term refers to a syndrome or a group of signs and symptoms that have hung together and come on together over some period of time. And so the term a major depressive episode re refers to a, a syndrome that's at least two weeks in duration and includes at least five key symptoms. There are, there are nine, more or less, symptoms that are possible to define an episode of major depression, and you need to have five of them, including a depressed mood and, and or a, a loss of interest or a sense of uh, inability to experience pleasure as the, one of the defining symptoms, and then at least four more. And in order to meet the syndromal criteria, these symptoms need to be experienced most every day uh, across a several week time period. Now, uh, some people oversleep when they're depressed, but more people have trouble falling asleep or staying asleep or, or waking up early in the morning. Similarly, some people overeat and a few even gain weight within an episode of depression. But more often, depression blunts your repetitive desires, and so people will lose appetite, and in more severe depression, will have uh, significant weight loss. Before 1980, the, the definitions of the depressive disorders were, were relatively brief and almost stereotypic, and, and many depressions experienced by people in the outpatient world were thought to be part of a neurotic condition. Since 1980, we've gone from thinking about neurosis to thinking about disorders, and so a major depressive disorder would be defined when someone has a major depressive episode that's not caused by some other medical condition or is not part of having schizophrenia. And our person who's suffering from this depressive episode does not have a past history of mania or, or hypomania because then their major depressive episode would be part of bipolar disorder. So uh, five or more symptoms over two or two weeks or longer uh, within the depressive syndrome, and, and then not caused by a medical condition, not part of schizophrenia, not part of bipolar disorder. So I mentioned 1980 as a touchstone because that was when the DSM-3 was published, and that's when the syndromal criteria, the fully spelled out ways of diagnosing the, the illness became part of our standard nomenclature. Now, since then, there have been two major revisions and some smaller revisions in between. And so since 2013, we've had the DSM-5. And in the DSM-5, the basic definition of a major depressive episode has stayed pretty much the same as it was in 1980, although some of the subtypes, some of the subsets of classification ha have changed over time. And so, for example, whether the depression is seasonal or whether it's associated with uh, postpartum onset, so forth, are, are now called episode specifiers. Uh, these were subtypes of depression. 20, 30 years ago. It's just a way in which the nomenclature has, has evolved. Over the last 20 years, so much more of depression treatment has uh, fallen under the purview of primary care providers, including uh, primary care physicians and primary care advanced nurse practitioners, and even physicians assistants are involved in uh, patient care outside of the psychiatric setting. Psychiatrists spend more time taking care of patients with more serious and complex illnesses, and including people who aren't responding to standard treatment. So it's not that hard to make the diagnosis of a depressive episode, but you do need some time. And so ways of streamlining or ways of improving efficiency have evolved to, to make primary care providers more efficient. And so a really useful scale called the PHQ-9 has the nine common signs and symptoms of, of depression with, with a little uh, three item rating scale for each one. So it enables you quickly to do the presence or absence of each of the uh, potential symptoms. And so you can at least weigh the syndrome and, and determine if the cardinal symptoms are there, often with the patient's help using the checklist even before they see you. Now, this doesn't uh, it's not foolproof. Sometimes there will be mistakes and, and you may overdiagnose depression when the person has another condition. You may miss a complicating condition like a substance abuse disorder in which withdrawal from the substance is actually causing the depressive syndrome. But it's a good starting place. And, and with the average follow-up visit for primary care, somewhere south of 
10 minutes, uh, having this checklist repeated at each visit gives you a way, again, of weighing how heavy the syndrome is and whether the patient's making progress with treatment. So depression is a condition that, that exists within a, a social matrix, and, and so it, it not only affects the sufferer, uh, but also affects their family. And, and so uh, it's, it's certainly valuable to have the input of family in terms of whether this illness is causing a problem, even whether it's an illness or not. Is, is this an extreme example of nor normal grief, or, or, or has it gone beyond that? So a family member's input and observations can be helpful. And this is particularly helpful when the differential diagnosis is one of bipolar disorder or recurrent depression, because in bipolar disorder, often patients see the hypomanias, sometimes even the manias, as, as their best self and, and not a sign of illness, whereas the family members appreciate this is different in magnitude and in a level of uh, impairment or dysfunction from the patient's best self.